Madeline Beth McKen was an energetic, innocent, and heartwarming young girl. Her unfulfilled childhood and endless potential to grow into an inspiring, creative, and world-impacting woman was cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing on May 3, 2007, leaving all who knew her in person and eventually both the entire United Kingdom and surrounding countries grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann and the mystery at Little Britain in the village of Pride Lewis, Portugal. Madeleine McCann was born on May 12, 2003 in Leicester, England to parents Kate and Jerry McCann. Kate and Jerry were Roman Catholic physicians and a loving pair meeting in Glasgow in 1993 before marrying five years later in 1998 it would be another half decade before the couple bore a child and introduced Madeline to the world two years before having two more children a set of twins Sean and Emily in 2005. Madeline, along with her younger brother and sister, formed a beautiful kinship with their parents and often traveled around the world on vacations and seeing the sights are in Europe. Both Kate and Jerry would later describe the mechanic plan as the perfect nuclear family of five. Madeline's parents described her as vivacious, a lively young girl and lovingly extroverted. She was a ringleader amongst her infant siblings and fellow toddlers. Never missing an opportunity to extend impressive social skills and communicating with those who gave her attention. Madeline's openness usually developed into an uncanny humor that's only an innocent, bright child cocoonja. They said her ability to express herself, unveil her imagination, and communicate with her feelings was second to none. Madeline's burst of energy inspired her to enact role-playing and forming miniature stories with playmates, creating a strong bond as she related so easily to other chill however. The never-ending drive in the little ray of sunshine often wore out her parents constantly needing attention from the people in the room she occupied. In fact, Madeline's youth was accompanied by hardships just as much as the positive bits. Kate and Jerry claimed the first six months of Madeline's life were very difficult and that she had suffered from college. She cried practically for 18 hours a day. We had to permanently carry her around. Colleague is an infamous illness found in babies, causing severe abdominal pain and intestinal blockage. The cries then transformed into screams after Kate gave birth to twins. Again, her parents explained that Madeline would run up and down in the background while Kate attended to the newborn babies. This hysteric hyperactivity would later prove a trait found in all the McKen siblings, but never broke up the unconditional happiness felt between the family members. Friends and family of the McKen offered similar sentiments as well. They all witnessed firsthand Madeline's brilliance and social inclinations while also noticing her protective nature towards her two siblings, often mothering them when their parents were out. In fact, some associates of the Makens believe Madeline and her siblings' camaraderie stopped at the presence of secluded strangers or an unknown group of people. However, because she knew how to engage even in foreign situations, relatives believed Madeline could get along with anyone if she was given the time. These careful observations and infinite effects of joy surrounded Madeline all the way up until a vacation she and her family took to pry the Lucy in the Algarve region of Portugal, settling in a well-known tourist town for British holiday makers. The Micken family quickly linked up with fellow doctors and assorted friends also vacationing in the area starting on Saturday, April the 28th, 2007. Kate, Jerry, Madeline and the twin youngsters were having a wonderful time on one of their many frequent trips and all the good times seemed destined for picture books. That is until the night of May the 3rd, 2007, barely a week before Madeline's fourth birthday. Kate and Jerry went out for dinner only to return to their flat and find missing their resilient and radiant daughter because sometime between 8.30 and 10 p.m., Madeline McKen disappeared without a trace, leading a void in the hearts of not just his family, but in the hearts of people around the world. Launching an exhaustive search that would soon evolve into the most discussed missing persons tragedy of the 21st century. 
On April the 28th, 2007, the McKin family travels to Pride Deluge, Portugal for a seven-day spring break getaway. The 1,000-person village is nicknamed Little Britain for the vast amount of UK travelers staying in the area. The Mackins retreat to 5A Rua Drive, Agostino de Silva, a flat owned by a retired teacher from Liverpool. Throughout the next week, the McKin family dines with seven other friends and five fellow children. The adults known as the Tapas Seven consisted of Fiona and David Payne, Diane Webster, James Tanner, Russell O'Brien, and Matthew and Rachel Oldfield. All of the men worked together over the years and their respective families all got along wonderfully. On day six of the vacation, May the 3rd, 2007, Madeline and her twin siblings hang out to the Ocean Club's Kids Club at the Prairie de Luz Resort, while her parents go for a walk at around 10 a.m. During breakfast, Madeline asks her parents, Why didn't you come when Sean and I cried last night? An hour and a half later at 12.30 p.m., Kate and Jerry pick their children up from the Kids Club and have back at 5 a before setting off for the swimming pool. At 2.29 p.m. that afternoon, Kate McKinn snaps the last photograph taken of her daughter. At the resort poolside with the sun shining and Madeline smiling per usual between 3.30 and 5.30 p.m., Madeline and her siblings return to the kids' club and eat dinner together. At approximately 6 p.m., Kate brings her children back to 5 while Jerry attends a tennis lesson elsewhere at the resort. Around 6.30 p.m., Jerry sends Tapa's seven but David Payne back to the apartments to check on his wife and three children. When the tennis lesson ends at 7 p.m., Jerry returns to five and helps Kate put Madeline, Sean, and Emily to bed. Their bedroom is fastened next to the front door at the flat. And as a single window overlooking the car park and public street, the shutter is closed before the children fall asleep. Between 7.30 p.m. and 8.30 p.m., Kate and Jerry clean up from the day's activities and share a bottle of wine together before heading off to dinner. At around 8.35 p.m., the McKinn couple is the first of the friend group to arrive at the resort Tapas restaurant. Located just 160 feet away from the A5 apartment, they reserve a table overlooking their living quarters where the top of Five could be seen. The resort staff leave a message in writing at the reservation is specific because the families have children sleeping back at the complex. Twenty minutes pass by and a few more members of the top of seven arrive at the restaurant at 8.55 p.m. As the friends begin their orders, Matt Old. Field quickly returns to the apartment complex to check on his flat and alert the Payne family that everyone else is waiting on them. Ten minutes later at 9.05 p.m., Jerry heads back to 5A to check on his own children. He walks through the unlocked back patio doors to avoid using the locked front door and potentially awakening the seeping youngsters like they had been doing all week. Everything inside seems normal until he finds the children's bedroom door to be open about 45 degrees instead of just ajar. Suspicious, Jerry peers his head in, but finds all three siblings fast asleep and accounted for. He closes the door bag at 5 degrees, uses the toilet, and departs. This is the last confirmed sighting of Madla McCann. A few minutes pass by and Jerry stops to speak with a friend and fellow holiday maker Jeremy Wilkins at 9.08 p.m. on the road near the Tapas restaurant. Throughout the next hour or so, members of the Tapas 7 swap turns going back to their apartment complex and checking in on their respective children. At 9.10 p.m., Jane Tanner walks up the road to her flat and passes by Jerry and Jeremy Wilkins without their notice. On her way, she sees a man walking across the path ahead of her, carrying a sleeping young girl wearing pink pajamas in his arms. It's a peculiar sight but not uncommon to a resort with many families. Tanner finds her daughter safe in her room and returns to the restaurant. A little later at 9.30 p.m., Kate gets up to check in on Fiva once more but fellow Tapa 7 friend Oldfield offers to do it instead while he keeps an eye on his own family. Kate agrees and Matt travels to the McCann's apartment. Inside, he finds the door to the children's room opened again, but to him, it means nothing. Instead, he pops his head in the door quickly and sees the twins sleeping in their respective cribs. 
From this vantage point, he doesn't explicitly notice Madeline and leaves the quiet building assuming all is perfectly normal. A half hour passes by and Kate makes another five a check her south at 10 p.m. However, when she goes to push the children's door open, a draft of wind from inside the room slams the door shut. Kate enters with force and finds the window open and the shutter pulled up. The twins sleep soundly in their beds, but Madeline is nowhere to be found. Minutes later, Rachel Oldfield rushes to find fellow Tapa's seven-member Jane Tanner in her apartment and relays the news of missing Madeline. Jane immediately calls back to her sighting and explains, Oh my God, I saw a man carrying a girl. Matthew Oldfield then travels to the 24-hour reception desk at the bottom of the resort's hill to alert them of the disappearance. An alarm is raised and police are called at 10.15 p.m. Fifteen minutes pass before the local authorities arrive at Flat 5A, along with the police. Around 60 staff members and assorted guests search the grounds for Madeline. An exhaustive hunt that lasts until 4.30 the following morning at 11.10 p.m. Special investigators from the police judiciary ventured to the scene and discovered the sliding glass door that was found open by Kate McKenna as a lock. Both Kate and Jerry are unsure if they actually locked it at the beginning of the vacation. While resort employees unveil that the cleaning staff will often open the sliding windows to air out department interiors. The special investigators are unable to confirm if this was the case. By the early morning hours of 2 a.m., Patrol dogs are called in to keep an eye on the search efforts six hours later at 8 a.m., for rescue dogs arrive to sniff the area around the resort, and attempt to catch trail of Madeline at 5 a.m. beyond. At 10 a.m., the local police finally set up roadblocks to monitor traffic both coming and leaving the resort and surrounding routes. Over the next 24 hours, up to 20 strangers outside of the main investigators and family members interact with the Five apartment later proving to taint much of the evidence and cause headaches for future forensic work. In the coming days, police began interviewing anyone and everyone associated with the resort or simply living in the area. Kate and Jerry rented out another nearby home to stay close to the investigation. Throughout the next 11 to 12 years, a combination of Portuguese Police Scotland Yard, Macon Associates, private investigators, and public empathizers have yet to find one solid trace of Madeline McCann. Certainly. Here's the revised script with corrected grammar. After faulty DNA findings and tabloid exploitation, the case has entered a sphere unlike any missing person's tragedy before. Madeline's disappearance changed the world to the point that many UK citizens and people close to the case define society as either before Madeline vanished or after Madeline vanished. Regardless of cultural impact or giving value to the importance of one case over another, one thing is certain. Until she is found, we must continue evaluating all theories, evidence, and tips. Until Madeline comes home or her fate is justifiably understood, and there are some major case points we need to examine. From the beginning of the search for Madeline McCann, Investigators knew that pinpointing suspects, or what the Portuguese classified as aguidos would be daunting, as the location of the disappearance happened to be a busy hotspot for tourists, residents, and complete strangers who came and went each day. Specifically, the late spring vacation season was ripe with faces both old and fresh, meaning the early list of aguidos would stretch to impossible numbers. Anyone could be guilty while everybody was innocent at the same time. They dashed at the catch-22. Luckily for the police, Jane Tanner recalled her peculiar incident from the evening of May the 3rd sooner rather than later. Her sighting of a man carrying a young girl away from the McKenna apartment complex would become the focal point of the early investigation and remain as the major case point in the eyes of the public following for almost six years. However, its importance isn't grounded by what it unveiled to authorities. Rather, grounded by what it distracted authorities from considering. It took up more than a decade of the precious moments spent looking for Madeline. Dubbed the Tana sighting, Jane Tana's testimony gave the first possible timeline of Madeline's suspected abduction. As mentioned previously, Jane had traveled from the Tapa's restaurant back to her flat to check in on her children at around 9.10 p.m. 
She walked down the road, passed by Jerry McCann as he spoke with a fellow vacationer, and headed into the complex. Both Jerry and the second man would later say they couldn't remember seeing Jane walk by them that evening. And due to the confines of the narrow street, police initially believed Jane to be fabricating the entire ordeal. Yet Jane stuck by her following claims and highlighted that while Jerry and the vacation didn't confirm her movements, they couldn't deny them either. A few minutes of walking later, and Jane witnesses an older man with what appears to be a toddler in his arms. She says he was crossing the junction of Francisco Gentle Martins and Rua Drive, Augusto da Silva, moving east and away from the corner of 5A, where the Macon children's bedroom was located. His direction was first determined as suspicious as he was supposedly walking in the direction of Robert Murat's residence, a 34-year-old Portuguese suspect early on in the hunt. Jane Tanner described the unidentified man as a white male standing at about 5 feet 7 inches with dark hair and complexion that would indicate European or Mediterranean descent. He seemed to be 35 to 40 years old from a distance, wearing beige pants, a dark jacket, and the demeanor of a local. The girl he was carrying was wearing pink and floral pajamas cuffed at the legs, much like Madeline was wearing. These descriptions were curiously withheld from media until May the 25th, three weeks after the disappearance. A few months later, in October 2007, money from a fund set up by the McKinn family was used for a forensic artist to recreate a simulated sketching of the Tanner sighting. The result is now one of the most famous images associated with Madeline's case. Sadly, the intensive search for the man from the Tana sighting turned out to be a six-year red herring chase. In October of 2013, Scotland Yard finally identified a British holiday maker who matched the T.S. description and fully corroborated with police. He explained that he was indeed carrying his own daughter after picking her up from the Ocean Club and heading back to their flat. To prove his innocence, the identified man dressed up in the same clothes as was mentioned in a T.S. report, and visually to the specific profile detailed in the sketch. The man was also able to provide the clothes his daughter was wearing the night of the sighting, as well, and once again the alibi cleared when the unveiled pajamas bore likeness to Madeline's Yor set but was, in fact, different. What frustrated authorities the most with the Italian sighting wasn't the lack of information it provided, but rather the time it took away from other potential pieces of evidence, an eyewitness testimony that would later prove vital. First off, the Tana sighting led investigators to believe the main abduction took place between 9 and 9.15 p.m., which they based their impending reports on. However, after learning the town of sighting had little to no connection, they had to retrace their steps and recalibrate more than half a decade's worth of thinking. Thus, Scotland Yard turned their attention to another eerily similar sighting from the night of May 3, 2007. This incident reported by Irish holiday makers, Martin and Mary Smith. The Smiths claimed that they saw a man carrying another child at about 10 p.m. in a location which was about 460 meters away from the Macons in 5A. The Smith sighting man was walking away from the Ocean Club and nearing the beach at Rua 25 Diabro. The Smiths described the new figure as a male standing at about 5 feet 8 inches with shorter brown hair and a slim build. He seemed to be in his mid-thirties from the Smiths' vantage point and wore bay shorts. Much like how Jane Tanner described the man in her sighting as not a tourist. The Smiths offered the same testament going as far as to say, the man seemed uncomfortable carrying the child. The girl he was carrying had blonde hair, pale skin, bare feet, and was wearing lighter colored pajamas, again like what Madeline was wearing. EFIT images were initially created back in 2008 when the testimony was first recorded, but the entire sightseeing was muddied when Martin Smith thought Jerry McCann fit the profile of the Smith's sighting man. Oakley International private investigators were quick to strike down the possibility since Jerry had been confirmed at the Tapas restaurant at 10 p.m., but the rumored confusion created sensitive press about the Smith's side. It wasn't until October of 2013 that it reverted law enforcement's attention and reset the timeline to the abduction happening just before the Smith's site. While the Tana sighting ended in lost time, 
It's sadly a common thread found in many missing persons cases and criminal investigations overall. Where a lead seems revolutionary, yet can take years only to find it with a dead end. Regardless of results, the sightings are also proof of just how vast the spider web of possibilities is with Madeline's disappearance. And the preceding searches and how one simple memory or visual can spawn thousands of theories that send everyone involved spinning in circles. One of the early theories cultivated by Portuguese investigators actually considered Kate and Jerry McConaughey's suspects. The base of the claim was built by supposed DNA evidence found by cadaver dogs inside the family's rental car after Madeline's disappearance, as well as DNA matching hers discovered behind the couch in the 5A apartment. This led police to draft a 10-page conclusionary report including wild ideas regarding a likely murder of Madeline, a cover-up fake abduction that involved the top of seven as conspirators to mislead police and even a claim that the number of suitcases each member of the party brought to Portugal was suspicious in nature. Realistically, none of the theories made sense or had conclusive evidence to back them up. The DNA found in the car and in the flat were tested using DNA methods and it was stated in the forensic reports that despite the matches to Madeline's DNA, the sample sizes were simply too small to consider credible. Not to mention, the hours upon hours spent questioning the Wacken couple and their friends who all cooperated fully and dedicated their testimony to truth and hope for Madeline's fate. In fact, almost as soon as the disappearance was reported, Kate set up a project called Madeline's Fund, leaving no stone unturned limited which immediately caught fire across the UK and raised thousands of dollars to help hire private investigators and allocate resources directly to spreading awareness. Unfortunately, the early consideration of the McKen couple as a Guidos fostered a tabloid firestorm that ended with lawsuits, deformation hearings, and unnecessary backlash that has turned a lot of the conversation around Madeline's disappearance to gossip and unsubstantiated finger-pointing because Kate and Jerry were soon relieved of suspicion after these reports were filed. They have since been 100% cleared by the current authority. There is no reason to consider their involvement as a realistic or plausible hypothesis and will not be considered any further. Another early theory proposed by investigators was a burglary gone wrong. According to records, the time between January and May of 2007 saw an unnatural rise in burglaries and burglary attempts in the area, including two around the McCann's apartment in the 17 days leading up to their vacation. These reports suggested that a burglary went into place the evening of May the 3rd of which Madeline interrupted after climbing out of bed and exiting a bedroom hence why the doors opened further than Gary had left it. Then the burglar would have taken Madeline as a precaution leaving through the bedroom window since it faced the street outside the resort. In April of 2017, Scotland Yard announced a foiled burglary attempt was no longer under consideration. After they had interviewed potential thieves in the area and other potential suspects, but found no evidence. While the theory wasn't completely ruled out, their focus would turn to other ideas a third position by investigators but quickly disregarded, is that Madeline wandered out of a bedroom on her own accord and was taken by a passerby or fell into a construction zone nearby. These musings were first discounted by Kate McKen who reminded police that Madeline would have had to open the patio doors on her own, close the blinds behind her. Remember to shut the door again, operate the childproof gate at the top of the stairs, and finally open and close the gate at the street level. All while being a three-year-old toddler and unseen by resort members. It's also regarded unlikely that Madeline climbed out of the bedroom window under her own power as well. The most agreed upon theory by private investigators and law enforcement is one of abduction, including pre-planned abduction. This theory stems from the bevy of suspects seen around the 5A apartment complex in the days leading up to Madeline's disappearance, looking suspicious or acting out of a normal manner, possibly carrying out reconnaissance for a bigger operation. For years, police have been tracking down these suspicious men, as well as known pedophiles, bogus charity collectors, and criminals who were later convicted of similar crimes and could be placed in or around the area in May of 2007. In the end, 
the unbelievable amount of press and scrutiny this case has received from various experts and media channels all across the world have bloated websites, editorials, and blog posts with both theories and conspiracies. Some crime scene experts who have taken a dive into Madeline's disappearance have stated that they do not believe the scene backs up an abduction hypothesis and believe Madeline was murdered. Other followers call the police work in the case as nothing more than hunches, reminding us that the treatment of the 5A apartment was so improperly handled that no evidence or forensic examination could be carried out and tainted. At least 20 different people went in and out of the room on May the 3rd. 2007 before it was taped off. Killer testing wasn't carried out for months, allowing new vacationers to rent the apartment from the resort before it was locked down by police again. This coincided with constant bickering back and forth between Portuguese police and investigators from the UK, where tensions were rather high after numerous law enforcement entities made their way to Portugal and interrupted the search. To top it all off, the tabloid interference and age of media bombardment against the McCanns skewed public perception and hindered authorities to go about their duties without incredible tension waiting around the corner. With the vast amount of possibilities, no theory can accurately be concluded as the answer. Authorities have released tens of thousands of documents and translated almost every single one of them. They've investigated over 8,000 claimed sightings of Madeline and had counted in 2015, that they took almost 1,400 statements, collected over 1,000 exhibits, investigated 650 sex offenders and 60 persons of interest, not counting the next four years of research. As of today, Madeline's case has received 11,750,000 euros in funding. Yet there are still so many unknowns associated with Madeline's vanishing, and until they are resolved, and police release every document, report, and case file, we must wait for new leads to surface while doing our part in spreading awareness. But let's take a look at some of the suspects. One way we want to help divulge information is by sharing a list of suspects still wanted in the hunt for clues leading to Madeline due to the sensitivity attributed to the case and the unfortunate loss of time in the early years of the investigation. We won't be drawing our own hypothetical conclusion. Instead, highlighting critical police sketchings and efforts of people either acting suspiciously around the time of Madeline's disappearance, or who have raised red flags in a variety of situations around Europe. Firstly, we have an unidentified woman whose profile was released on August 2009. The woman in question was seen near Port Olympic Marina in Barcelona, Spain, on May 7, 2007, just 72 hours after Madeline disappeared. She appeared agitated, was nicely dressed but kept pacing up and down the street by Ray de la Gamba restaurant and bar. Two passing British men noticed the disturbed woman and decided to approach her. When one of the men, who wishes to remain anonymous, asked if everything was okay, the woman asked, Are you here to deliver my new daughter? No other details are known. But the British witnesses say that after their conversation, the woman had a colorful argument in Spanish with a local inside the neighboring pub. Again, no other details have surfaced except that the witness described the woman's accent to be of Australian qualities and appeared as an Australian Victoria Beckham lookalike. Next, we have an unidentified man who was spotted three different times by a fellow holidaymaker, Gail Cooper, who was in Praia de Luz on vacation from England. The first time she saw the man, he was walking in his lonesome under a heavy rainstorm along an abandoned beach on April the 20th, 2007. Later the same day, the man with olive skin and shoulder-length hair knocked on Gail's door and pretended to be a charity collector, a popular con around the resort area during the spring of 2007. Two days later, on April the 22nd, Gail saw the man for a final time, hanging around a children's event sponsored by the Mark Warner Resort. Gail was called back to Portugal in 2008 to work with the detectives on recreating the man's likeness through two sketches. At first, the man was thought to be the same man whom James Tanner witnessed carrying a small child away from the apartments back on May the 3rd. But when he was cleared, the long-haired man was confirmed as a separate individual. 
In 2010, private investigators showed clips they had filmed of a man from inland Portugal, doing labor outside of a white truck. Gale watched these unreleased clips and found that despite the lack of a mustache and lighter hair color, the recorded man was the same man from the Praia de Luz beaches in April of 2007. Similar stories compared to the previous men have been updated with police sketches as well. Again, other witnesses claimed to have interacted with fake charity workers in the area around the time Madeline vanished and gave descriptions that were translated to pictures of these two men. Two other fair-haired men were also described to have been hanging near the McKin flat around May the 3rd and were thought to be of Scandinavian, German, or Dutch heritage. Another pair of EFIT profiles were uncovered in old Portuguese police reports and subsequently unveiled to the public, again representing suspicious men appearing in the area. In addition, the Smith sighting evidence also resulted in two different EFIT creations for a man seen carrying a small child at 10 p.m. on May the 3rd. Another mysterious encounter resulted in police sketches occurred three days after Madeline's disappearance but wasn't announced to the McKinn family or the public for over a year until the eyewitness was approached by Mirror magazine. Annette, then 41 years old, made a call to Dutch police when she thought Madeline and an older Dutch couple walked in at an Amsterdam shop on May the 6th, 2007. According to Annette, the man was between 35 and 40 years old, with a mustache, dark skin, and spoke Portuguese. The woman he was with was a little older, maybe in her 40s, with brown hair and spoke French. Accompanying them was a little girl. The following are direct quotes from Annette in Mirror Magazine who said, I'll never forget the girl. She had her hair in a ponytail, huge green-brown eyes, a pale face which showed no emotion. I didn't like the man. He didn't look like a nice person. I work in a party shop, so most people smile when they come in to buy things, but he didn't smile back at me when I smiled at him. He had no sparkle in his eyes. He was short with me and seemed angry. I got the feeling. He didn't want me to interfere with him and the others. The woman was also peculiar acting stressed and uncomfortable, Annette said. She tried to smile at me, but it was out of obligation, not from the heart. The whole way they reacted made a big impression on me. The man spoke in Portuguese. I know because I have Brazilian friends. The woman spoke in French while the little girl spoke English. It didn't seem like a real family. When the girl spoke, she allegedly mentioned, My name is Maddie, followed by She is not my mummy. They took me from my holiday. Anna later recalls thinking, The woman told me she was in a station wagon, a larger car. Maybe they were going on a long journey because this woman spoke French. I immediately thought that they would go to Belgium or France. This would later connect the dots with early police theories that feared Madeleine had been taken by a Belgian pedophile gang, followed by three separate sightings of Madeleine lookalikes in Belgium after May the 6th. Because Anna wasn't 100% certain that there were any criminal acts associated with the encounter, she didn't report it to the police right away until a month later when she saw the Madeleine McKinn case discussed on television. The Dutch police created EFITS and sent it along to Portuguese police on June the 18th, 2007, but the info never made it to the McKinn family. So when and heard that over a year later in the summer of 2008, the McKinn family had no knowledge of her testimony, she took it upon herself to connect with the current British law enforcement covering the case and cycled back through her memories. Thus, the sketches of the French woman and Portuguese mustached man were created, leaving Anna fearful her testimony came too late and the potential lead lost in translation. Probably the most disturbing police sketch is that of the pockmarked man. The man in question was seen multiple times hanging around the McKinn apartment by three separate witnesses, all in the time frame of the McCann's vacation. The first witness, a 12-year-old local girl who saw the pockmarked man outside the balcony of 5A at 8.15 a.m. on April 30th, in her own words, the girl said, I was walking to the school bus stop. I go this way to school every day. I saw a man on the small path behind the block. He seemed to be looking at the balcony of the ground floor apartment. 
My grandparents used to live in that department, so I always look at it as I pass by. A few days later, on May the 2nd, the day before Madeline disappeared, the girls saw the same man looking at the McKinn flat again around lunchtime. The second witness was a female British tourist who recorded the following. I saw a man acting suspiciously on two occasions. The first time I saw him, I was walking along the road with my daughter. I grabbed my daughter's hand and pulled her towards me because, for some reason, the man unnerved me. The next time I saw him, he was standing on the opposite side of the apartment. He was watching it. I would describe him as very ugly with pitted skin and a large nose. The third witness, a man from Cheshire, was walking with his partner at 11.30 a.m. along the road by 5 a. but couldn't remember if it was May the 2nd or 3rd. He said, I saw a man standing next to a wall on the opposite side of the road was a white van. I paid particular attention to him because he appeared to be focused on watching the apartment block. As I walked past him, I looked at him, and for a split second, we had eye contact. But then he just carried on staring at the apartment. All three sightings have incredibly creepy backstories to them and truly send shivers down the spine when inspecting the man's sketch. If Madeline's abduction was preplanned, finding the figure who was seen multiple times by multiple people, analyzing the McCann's living quarters could lead to valuable information. If the man in these testimonies or any of the presented drawings rings a bell at all, please speak up and say something. Even though it's been almost 12 years since that tragic night in Praia de Luz, we must remain diligent in our pursuit of Madeline's captor or anyone who might be involved. We'd love to make detailed videos about a single possible suspect, but there are so many involved it pains us to leave out smaller players who could still have a big role. We recommend everyone who's interested in the case to research the other persons of interest, and we have provided some useful links in the description. Madeline wasn't just a ray of sunshine, but also a child constantly absorbing knowledge with the potential to grow into a gifted and gracious human being. She was stripped of that opportunity, but the chance to rekindle her spirit isn't gone forever. There are still zero signs or clues provided that would lead investigators to think she is deceased, and until we find evidence that suggests otherwise, we must act as if her heart still beats somewhere out in the world. Whether it's in Europe or elsewhere, Madeline's will to survive does not go away with time past. Her energetic soul and compassionate heart deserve our attention our grace, and our utmost determination. The little girl who loved to communicate, display her affection for family, and find the beauty in all that entered her youthful, innocent life needs our help. And we'd be defying our duty as fellow dreamers of the human race if we didn't pour our faith into the efforts of finding Madeline McCann or direct evidence that leads to someone who knows of her fate. Rico Omar Harris, known to the world of basketball, and all who followed his career as simply Rico, was an extroverted athletic, one-time world-renowned basketball prodigy. His energetic, entertaining skill set followed by a courageous battle against addiction and apparent recovery was cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in October of 2014, leaving all who knew him, from college basketball fans in Los Angeles to the Harlem Globetrotters, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. Rico Harris was born on May 19, 1977, to parents Henry Harris and Margaret Fernandez in Los Angeles, California. After moving to Oregon for a little while to account for Henry's new job, the Harris family quickly bonded with one another but moved back to Los Angeles soon after to raise three additional children. During their younger years, the Harris siblings were subjected to violent and abusive tendencies at the hands of their father. Rico specifically was a frequent target of Henry's rage, taking the brunt of his abuse, despite desperately seeking out his approval as he grew into a teenager. Henry's collision course eventually drove Margaret away, and she took her children with her to Alhambra, California. Rico, the eldest brother, took it upon himself to help support the family, and while Margaret would work full-time, he watched over his siblings. While his parents urged him to use his big-body frame in sports, 
Rico decided to pursue basketball at age 15. To improve his chances of finding success, he enrolled in Hollywood High School, a headache of a drive all the way from Alhambra. However, these aspirations only lasted a year before Rico realized he was born to play basketball and used his father's address to attend Temple City High School. By the time he was 16 years old, Rico was already 6 feet 8 inches tall and 250 pounds, a colossal young man. It didn't take long for him to take control of the basketball court, dominating his opponents and entertaining the crowds with his explosive style of play. He transformed a once dormant high school club into a powerhouse program, drawing in college scouts as he reflected the style of Magic Johnson and broke through double team defenses. Off the court, he was an introverted adolescent without much academic prowess. Until he met a girlfriend whose family helped him achieve higher grades in school. This helped Rico find even more success in basketball, and during his senior season, he averaged 28 points, 15 rebounds, and was compared to top basketball recruits in the Western United States, such as Jason Terry and Paul Pierce. Sadly, because Rico failed to receive high marks on the SAT, his scholarship offers from top-flight universities such as UCLA were rescinded. Thus, Rico ended up at Arizona State to take classes before regaining eligibility to play basketball. For the first time in his life, Rico was away from friends and his close-knit family, and it caused struggles in his studies and his social life. In March of 1996, he was briefly accused of unlawful imprisonment along with two other teammates. But the charges were dropped, and Rico was told he had to sit out a second sports season to clean up his act. Refusing to sacrifice additional precious time, Rico transferred to Los Angeles City College. He was able to join the basketball team and immediately let his presence be known. He guided the LACC club to a state title and won most valuable player. But by his second year, Rico found himself in academic decline and trending towards an unhealthy lifestyle, constantly consuming alcohol despite still performing at a high level on the basketball court. When he lost connection to his former girlfriend and acknowledged his deteriorating emotional health, Rico shut down his recruitment from other colleges, fearing they only wanted his skills rather than his personal development, and declared for the NBA draft. Once again, this plan went up in flames when Rico kept pushing off special events to showcase his skills in order to remain close to home. As a byproduct, he withdrew his name from draft consideration, declining various college offers to play Division I college ball, and transferred to Cal State Northridge. Many thought it was a poor choice for Rico's future career, and the doubters were unfortunately correct. Over the summer between semesters, Rico attempted to reconcile with his estranged father Henry, but was swiftly rejected. Caught in the purgatory of social and emotional negligence, Rico continued to lose focus and lost interest from the NBA during his only lackluster season at CCUN. As per NCA eligibility, Rico turned to semi-professional basketball to keep his NBA dream alive. He played in San Diego, St. Louis, and other pickup teams before deciding to join the Harlem Globetrotters, a comedic exhibition basketball team. In a tragic twist, Rico found himself in a scuffle in South LA one month into the Globetrotters gig, in which he was hit in the back of his head by a baseball bat. While he survived, Rico suffered from balance issues and headaches thereafter, effectively ending his basketball career. After moving back to Alhambra with his mother and siblings, Rico entered a seven-year stretch of battling addiction that started with alcohol and exploded into heroin, meth, and cocaine. In fact, all of the Harris siblings were suffering from some version of substance abuse, and then Mother Margaret did everything she could to help them with their demons. After Rico turned 30 years old in 2007, he finally sought true help and entered rehab. The program lasted longer than normal, but in the end, Rico recovered from his addiction. In 2012, he met Jennifer Song, a Seattle insurance broker, and the two entered a romantic relationship. Throughout the next couple of years, Jennifer and Rico became very close. 
Rico eventually moved to Seattle permanently and started planning a life with Jennifer as a married couple. The two talked about having children and setting up a happy future. Rico even lined up a job interview as a property appraiser, an incredible opportunity considering all he had to overcome. However, before Rico could make the final transformation, he had to go back home to Alhambra one more time to find closure with his family. He arrived on October the 9th, 2014, and had dinner with his brother, gifting him a new cell phone. Rico then visited his mother, engaging in a one-on-one -on -one private conversation. Whatever resulted in the exchange is unknown, but it's believed to have been against Rico's wishes. Rico left for Seattle again just after midnight and stopped in Lodi, California for gas. He drove all night and in the morning called Jennifer to let her know he was going up into the mountains to rest. It was the final point of contact anyone made with Rico Harris, and he soon disappeared into the North Sacramento wilderness. In early September of 2014, Rico and his girlfriend, Jennifer, enjoyed their intimate, hopeful relationship with one another and began to think about the future together. However, Jennifer noticed something off with Rico, who acted abnormally and lost his sense of organization. After she persisted in questioning him, Rico revealed he lapsed the previous summer of 2014 with alcohol consumption. While it hadn't turned back into a habit, the return to an old threw Jennifer off balance. Rico's relapse is confirmed by longtime friend David Lara, who had rekindled their friendship around the same time. Later in September, despite the earlier friction, Rico and Jennifer settled on taking their relationship a step further and move in together in Seattle, Washington. It's seen as a monumental endeavor for Rico, who previously struggled, went away from his hometown of Los Angeles, and close-knit family. The couple engaged in intense conversations about marriage, having children, and exploring true love, yet Rico still felt insecure about the new surroundings. It took him almost a month to unpack, as Rico felt awkward making himself at home in a living space that wasn't his own. Jennifer later says it was Rico's sensitive underlying will to provide for loved ones that fed the insecurity and not lingering second thoughts or laziness. Within the first week of October, things changed for the better. Rico secured a job interview for a position as a property appraiser at a local real estate company. The new opportunity sparked joy and encouragement, and Rico finally unpacked his belongings in Jennifer's house a signal he was ready for change and was there to stay in Seattle. The happy eyes shifted unexpectedly on October the 8th, 2014, when Rico told Jennifer he was going out later in the day to explore, a bit strange compared to Rico's usual activity. Yet Jennifer didn't think twice about it and kissed her fiancé goodbye. But when Jennifer calls Rico later in the evening of October the 8th, Rico informs her that he's on his way to Los Angeles to visit with his family. Rico explains that he wants closure from the dark past of his childhood and to create trust with his mother again regarding their relationship and his future. Jennifer, while taken aback, understands his well meetings and supports his quick decision. Jennifer remembers Rico sounding excited to move on, his head seemingly in the right space. Rico arrives in Alhambra the next day on October the 9th. His mother, Margaret, notes his excitement about the recent changes and ultimately about his flourishing life. However, Margaret also suspects Rico to have been drinking more under the influence of a substance. In the evening of October the 9th, Rico leaves his mother's house and has dinner with one of his younger brothers. He buys his brother a new cell phone, and the two reminisce of old times. After the brothers' rekindling, Rico heads back to Margaret's house in Alhambra to engage in a private conversation and again seek the closure he desires from a tattered childhood. The conversation does not last long, and Margaret later claims she felt Rico hadn't taken from the conversation what he had hoped for in terms of emotional revelation. Not long after the clock strikes midnight on Friday, October the 10th, Rico decides to head back to Seattle rather than spending the night like his mother expected. In order to have extra prep time for his interview, 
He takes a few extra personal belongings from his mother's home and hits the road. At around one o'clock, Rico calls his mother again to explain his rash decision. Margaret recalls her son saying something along the lines of, I have these things that I need to do. Right after talking to his mother, Rico then calls Jennifer once again, surprising her with the premature return home. The couple talks for three to four hours, throughout which Jennifer encourages Rico to find a motel and sleep, considering he had been awake for 40-plus hours. Rico finally comes around but expresses the desire to drive up to the nearby mountains for a quick nap. Jennifer suggests an alternative, reminding him he'd have no cell service at high altitude, and the dark winding roads would be dangerous in the thick of night. The two end their phone call with Rico still set on driving. At 8 a.m. on October the 10th, Rico receives a second call from Jennifer after she slept for a few hours. Rico informs her that he's getting gas at a station near Sacramento in a town called Lodi, California. He sounds incredibly tired from his end of the phone. A an hour or so later, Rico was contacted again, this time by his mother, wondering about his progress. Rico finally admits to his exhaustion and claims he's going to find somewhere to rest and eat throughout the morning. Both Jennifer and Margaret make multiple calls to Rico to check in on his resting plans, but Rico never picks up. After a few unsuccessful tries, Jennifer sends him a text. At 10.44 a.m., Rico finally responds to Jennifer's text and says he is doing well but gives little details. This is the last official contact anyone makes with Rico Harris. As morning shifts to the afternoon, Jennifer tries to let Rico's rest time go uninterrupted. Yet her anxieties get the best of her, and she calls him anyway, still getting no response. Jennifer tells herself he must still be in the mountainous region of California, and the cell service is playing a role. Between 7 and 8 p.m., Jennifer officially falls under the silence of Rico, and calls Margaret to worry. Margaret, on the other hand, is calm and guesses Rico is just operating on his own will, not uncommon to his personality. Sometime before midnight, Rico records himself singing along to in his parked car but appears to be doing so unintentionally. He also throws around various CDs from the passenger compartment as well. These video clips are later found to be timestamped on the evening of October the 10th confirming he was alive and functioning at that time. At 11.15, Rico's cell phone turns off. Whether it was by Rico himself or due to battery failure is unknown. The weekend of October 11th and 12th goes by, and Rico never returned any calls or returns to Seattle. Yet Jennifer and Margaret hold off on reporting it, remembering he won't escape to San Diego for a few hours without notice and give him a couple of days to reappear. On Monday, October the 13th, a Yolo County deputy sheriff makes a routine check of an isolated rest area parking lot at Rumsey Canyon in Ramsey, California, along California State Route 16. He finds a black Nissan Maxima off to the side in the dirt lot with no nearby passengers but lets it be. The following day on Tuesday, October the 14th, the same Yolo County Sheriff returns to his route and finds the Nissan in the same spot in the parking lot. He runs the plate in his database and discovers it belongs to Rico Harris, his address still linked in Alhambra. The Yolo County Sheriff's office calls Margaret to inform her they found the car but no person, and she then calls Jennifer, trying to make sense of what both women described as a surreal dream. Margaret officially files a missing persons report with the Alhambra Police Department, and law enforcement opens an investigation. Over the next week or so, they put together a vast network of searches and rescue personnel. Helicopters with thermographic cameras fly over the surrounding areas. All-terrain vehicles are commissioned for the mountainous search zone, and cadaver dogs are deployed to pick up any lingering scent of Rico. Overall, the crews covered a 5-mile radius of the parking lot and a 27-mile stretch of Ramsey Canyon, along Route 16, but find little clues besides unidentified footprints in the dirt alongside the road. Using cell phone data, police interview residents of nearby locals and receive a few reassuring sightings dated back to Sunday, October 12th, 
but nothing concrete surfaces. On October the 19th, investigators receive another tip about the sighting of a large man walking along Route 16, and subsequent shoe prints are found in the dirt once again. However, the location of the previous eyewitness testimony and footprints compared to the October 19th clues lead police to conclude Rico had left the site of his car at Ramsey Canyon, walked along the Cache Creek, and then returned to the original spot for unknown reasons. This revelation would provide the strongest foundation for later theories. A few days later, on October the 22nd, the search is pulled back and slowly dwindles down. In mid-November of 2014, divers return to deeper sections of the surrounding bodies of water to record more searches, but again, find nothing of use or suspicion. Since the mid-October mystery, Nobody has found credible evidence to lead police to answers or spark reasonable theories outside of speculation. Currently, we are only left with what was found in those few weeks of investigating, making the entire ordeal murky with dead ends and puzzle pieces without a home. In the case of the disappearance of Rico Harris, most of the tangible clues were discovered in the first week or so of searches. But none was more perplexing than the backpack and cell phone recovered on a guardrail along Route 16 near Cache Creek. After police assessed cell phone records from the provider company, data pings led them to the Redwood Valley area in Northern California, about 70 miles northwest from where Rico's vehicle was originally located. To cover all their bases, authorities called as many residents as they could in the surrounding communities, leaving messages on voicemails asking for tips. It didn't take long for the scheme to produce results when lead investigator Dean Island received a call from a Redwood Valley man who claimed to have found items belonging to Rico. Police immediately responded to the tip and learned that the Redwood man indeed had a black backpack owned by Rico Harris. Inside the backpack were jumper cables and his cell phone. The man explained that he, his wife, and their grandchild were driving along Route 16 when the young boy alerted his grandparents that the stray backpack was on the curb of the highway and alarmingly out of place amid the surroundings. The man pulled over, and the trio shouted into the wilderness to hopefully make contact with the bag's owner. When they found nobody down the creek, the Redwood family checked the bag for ID. All they found were the cables and phone, so they took it with them in hopes to charge it and contact someone. Law enforcement quickly assumed the backpack to be Rico's. Not only was the bag like a purse, according to Jennifer, who recognized the parcel instantly, but was also found only 1,500 feet from a sighting reported by a passerby earlier in the week, someone who had seen a large African-American man standing along the guardrail on Route 16. These inclinations were confirmed when the officers assessed the cell phone and combed through its information pulled from the phone would later prove to be crucial visual evidence in creating the timeline of Rico's last known actions. In his media gallery, Rico had videos of himself singing along to music in his car, seemingly ignorant of the fact that he was recording himself. Along with absent-minded singing, Rico was also seen throwing around CDs in the cabin, ripping up random papers, and playing with the sunroof controls. These clips were saved in the evening hours of October the 10th, meaning Rico was alive that night and probably showcased the reason why the vehicle was out of gas and had a dead battery. The fact that Rico had been tossing items around in the car also helped explain why the car had originally appeared ransacked when investigators towed it into the station. Most importantly, however, the cell phone videos gave authorities a better idea about the state of mind Rico was in around the time he'd last made contact with his family. The fact that Rico recently relapsed with drug use was thought to have consumed alcohol while in Alhambra, engaged in difficult emotionally draining conversations with his family, and was awake for an estimated 50 hours straight would certainly lead to a fragile psyche. This combined with Rico's indecisive demeanor, and lifetimes worth of personal struggles could have tripped him into madness, or at least extreme exhaustion. Without a doubt, the backpack, cell phone, and overall major case point show Rico was in trouble. And if not from a third party, then at least from his own beaten bat itself. 
The first and most popular theory discussed in the case of Rico Harris developed into a confusing speculative story of foul play. The hypothesis originated with the Yolo County Sheriff's Department after the Nissan was found abandoned and seemingly plundered. Besides the mess of papers, CDs, and bottles in the back seat, investigators also know Rico's wallet was left behind, still full of its contents, except for a discovery credit card. On the exterior, the car wasn't parked in any of the marked parking slots and had both no gas and the dead battery. Police calculated that after filling up with gas in Lodi, California, Rico took a wrong turn and headed northeast on Route 16. When he found the Cache Creek Park in Rumsey Con, he pulled off to rest, released pent-up energy, and was eventually embattled with a third party to explain the defects of the car. Investigators guessed the gas must have been siphoned. This theory would also explain why a 6'8", 300-pound man could so easily slip through the cracks outside of a few potential sightings. Men of that size typically don't go away unnoticed unless another person or persons drive them away, or something far sinister. The foul play musings became much more obscure when Rico's backpack and footprints were discovered. Because the cell phone videos show Rico sitting in an idle car on October 10th, it's possible he ran out of gas and used the battery from extended periods of running both the engine and the audio system. Normal cars can run through 1.5 gallons of gas per hour just in the idle position. So it's in the realm of possibility that Rico let his car run through the night to the 10th and into the weekend of October the 11th and 12th. It would also help explain why the interior of the car was wrecked and why jumper cables were in Rico's possession. He was probably looking for someone to help jump his battery, meaning the footprints along Route 16 suggested Rico walked along the highway to flag down passers-by. There was also zero DNA findings to corroborate third-party interference or the presence of a stranger. So while Rico certainly didn't encounter foul play while in his car at Cache Creek, Investigators still theorize he met with trouble after hitchhiking along Route 16. They believe while walking and talking to anyone who would pull over to assist him, Rico was taken advantage of by someone or somebody with criminal intentions. It's very likely Rico was not in the right frame of mind that weekend, and if he came across as exhausted or groggy, his could easily persuade him to leave his backpack behind and get in the vehicle. It's a bit confusing as to why someone would risk dealing with a man who is almost guaranteed to have a physical advantage, not to mention no money on their person, but it's also worth remembering Rico relapsed shortly before his disappearance. And if he found someone who promised him drugs or other substances, how likely would he have been persuaded? Well, this figure could be ranges from a potential killer to a drug dealer to someone desperate for a man of Rico's stature. Unfortunately, there are hardly any leads or threats associated with the foul play theory besides combing through people with criminal backgrounds in the area. Due to the vast population of Northern California and the Sacramento area, the possibilities are borderline infinite. Another theory considered by many is that Rico was wounded and taken by a wild animal or large predator. Northern California has its fair share of wildlife, including combative creatures such as rattlesnakes, mountain lions, and black bears. A rattlesnake would certainly be able to bite and poison an unsuspecting human. But if Rico was in fact bit by a snake, his body would have been picked up by the air helicopters or numerous search parties. Black bears, while imposing animals, are in fact quite docile and do not interact with humans very often, let alone a large man the size of somebody like Rico. The only animal that makes sense is a mountain lion, yet it would take a considerably strong cougar or pack of cougars to kill Rico and then take his body into a dwelling cave or habitat hidden from humans. The search found no signs of struggle in the dusty expanse of Ramsey Canyon. And again, the mere size of Rico probably deterred wild animals from approaching. And if he did die somewhere in the wilderness, his body would not have tokayed into the ground and avoided visibility due to the timeline of the disappearance and impending manhunt. The third theory associated with Rico involved around a planned escape and manufactured disappearance. 
This conspiracy points to Rico's history with indecision and probable disappointment with the closure he sought when returning to Alhambra. Supporters of the story suggest that Rico realized in his return home, he no longer wanted the life he hoped for in Seattle, and thought best to vanish without a trace and escape somewhere new. The theory points to the new cell phone Rico bought for his brother highlighting the Rico could have bought a second phone that he used for his getaway, and that his brother helped him along the way. After the conversation with his mother went south, Rico decided to leave unnoticed using his scheduled interview as an excuse. On the way to Sacramento, Rico slowly broke off contact his mother and girlfriend and veered off course from Interstate 5 to Seattle and drove east to Cache Creek. When he arrived he recorded himself to appear distressed and potentially even stage a kidnapping or robbery. After the car finally ran out of gas and electricity, Rico walked off with his backpack and old phone appearing to need help with the jumper cables. Instead, when Rico flagged down a car to hitchhike he left the bag and cell phone find to create a diversion. Some goes far to say whoever picked him up was in on his plan and a link to Rico's stage disappearance and his new life. In the end, this theory is rife with inconsistencies. Rico had been adamant to all he knew that the opportunities in Seattle were incredibly encouraging. He had recently become a resident of Washington State, constantly talked about marriage and fatherhood, and truly settled in with Jennifer. Police also tracked the missing discovery credit card found missing from Rico's wallet, and the account was never assessed or operated at any time following October the 10th. Meaning that if Rico escaped, the funds he would most certainly need to execute such a scheme came elsewhere and not from personal wealth. Taking into consideration the skill and resourcefulness needed to pull off such a feat, the improbability of faking a mental collapse seen in the selfie videos, and coincidental contrast of Rico's recent attitudes towards life. The idea that Rico stays at his appearance and escape thereafter is highly implausible before we divulge our hypothesis of Rico's mysterious disappearance. We want to make known our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective. Our purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not attempt to promise certain or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in the closing. We simply observe research and report. In this case, we believe Rico continued to relapse into substance abuse as a result of personal torment and extreme exhaustion. Fanned himself alone and free of scrutiny out in the wild after making a wrong turn on his journey and wandered into unknown territory where he most likely died hidden by the natural elements. All of his life, Rico gout with the absence of a caring nurturing father, despite the physical and verbal abuse he sustained in his youth, Rico sought his father's approval and internalized his love for basketball. After he and his siblings moved in with their mother, Rico never quite broke off the relationship he had with Henry Harris. When Rico's basketball career fizzled out and he turned to drugs and alcohol, Rico swelled the bubbling tension from a rough childhood. To make matters more complicated, Rico ran into his own father in jail after an arrest for public intoxication. These humiliations and unresolved conflicts took a psychological toll on Rico, leaving him with signs of undiagnosed depression, anxiety, and possibly bipolar disorder revealed by Jennifer after he disappeared. Taking a history of mental troubles into consideration, a relapse into substance use, and family or shortcomings would have put Rico in a very dark place on his drive back to Seattle after his attempts to tie knots on his past fell short and failure created the wounds in his heart and mind to irreversible sizes. Thus after staying awake for more than two consecutive days, the emotional instability caught up to Rico and he ventured from the planned course. On his drive up north, he probably took a wrong turn that took him through the mountains of northern Sacramento and into Ramsey Canyon. Between the stop for gas and Lodi and parking in the lower side of Cache Creek Park, Rico found an outlet for drugs and alcohol and picked him up. Hard drugs are notoriously distributed throughout Sacramento and the surrounding regions, 
so it wouldn't be too tricky for a former addict to navigate and purchase. After he parked, Rico either consumed the drugs he had collected or experienced the side effects in full force. It's plausible he had taken either crack or methamphetamine throughout the trip anyways, stimulants that explain how he could stay awake and alert for so long. The drug reasoning comes from a vital clue found in the Nissan Shima after police towed the vehicle into evidence. Under the glove compartment below the passenger seat, investigate a discovery bundle a plastic wrap used specifically for drugs. Now the bindling question was empty and contained no residue or drug paraphernalia but hinted at a recent inclination towards substance use. There were also two bottles of alcohol found, one empty and the other half full also thought to be consumed by Rico. After the car ran out of power and gas, Rico wandered off from the lower side along the guardrail on the highway. He set his backpack and cell phone on the curb and walked down to the actual creek for a drink and cooled down where enormous footprints were found days later by the search teams. After spending time by the water, Rico found an easier way up the hill back to the road, a different place than where he'd left his belongings. While continuing to plot along Route 16, Rico was able to hitchhike and find a way into a small town or establishment where he could clean up and find something to eat. A couple vagrants in Clear Lake, California have said they recognized Rico buying drugs in the area once, but didn't have any details or further information regarding their testimony. The last part of this theory is quite cloudy. What Rico engages with throughout the next week is a complete mystery but he avoids eyewitnesses and returns to the lower side in Ramsey Canyon, where his car was parked on October the 19th. It was this night when someone reported sighting a large African-American male walking in that direction, and police later confirmed it with more footprints in the immediate area. Rico was probably dropped off so that he could return to his car. But when he found it was hauled away, either went back to the vehicle that dropped him off or decided to stick the new friend freedom and march into the woods. What happened afterwards is the true meat of the mystery. As mentioned previously, Rico was hard to miss and his profile didn't allow for much invisibility. Maybe he tripped into a sinkhole or that camouflaged him from search and rescue. Maybe he took his own life in a deep part of the rugged forest regardless of details. Rico Harris was dealing with issues none of us can father more ignore. Whether it was a lack of sleep, a depressive episode triggered from recent events or a combination of anxiety and drug use. Rico wasn't in his normal state of mind. His reckless activity in the cell phone videos proves just as much. And unfortunately casts a heavy shadow of unpredictable behavior that stemmed afterwards. The Harris family and Rico's close friends have often talked about Rico's history with drugs and addiction to a stigmatized character and undermine the public perception of the case. We want to be perfectly clear. Rico's struggles with substances does not take away from the compassionate and caring person he was. He deserves just as much attention as any missing person and is not any more of a bad guy than you are. Addiction sting will be damned. Addiction is a disease of mind and body and can create turmoil of both physical and emotional health. Those who struggle with addiction must battle not only their own sickness, but the constant degradation of society and those who categorize addictive persons as failures to the consequences of their actions. Rico Harris deserves to be found. He was a warrior, a courageous spirit that endured so much pain throughout his life. He finally found the light at the end of the tunnel the dawn breaking from a treacherous night. He loved his family, he loved his friends, and he loved making a difference in people's lives. Outside of his athletic giftedness, Rico was a kind soul. He would have gone unthinkable distances to help those in need, so it's only fitting we do the same in his favor. Let not his legacy be Harlem Globetrotter to drug it to missing person. Let his legacy be of caretaker to a fighter, to a found and fostering father, his ultimate aspiration. Like this video and subscribe our channel. Phoenix Caldon was an endlessly inquiring, spirited, and musically talented young woman. 
Her dedications to religion and giftedness in the arts were cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in December of 2011, leaving all who knew her, both in life and through the world wide web, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Colden and the mystery at the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue. Phoenix Colden was born on May 23, 1988, to parents Gloria and Lawrence Colton. After spending some time of her youth in the sunny state of California, Lawrence's job moved the family to the greater St. Louis, Missouri area where they spent the remainder of their time together. The Coldens moved into a residential neighborhood of Spanish Lake, a quiet and middle-class suburb where Gloria and Lawrence would commit to raising their bright and beloved daughter. From an early age, Phoenix was raised in a world surrounded by church and Christian values. Her parents kept a close eye on her demeanor and social interactions, making sure she kept true to kindness, compassion, and respect. This was coupled by a strong attraction to music and instrumentation as Phoenix developed a profound talent for the musical arts. Every Saturday morning, she would practice on the family's piano, quickly falling in love with the craft and finding a means in which to express herself. Phoenix's time at home increased when she entered middle school after her parents decided that she was better off in homeschool rather than attend a public institution. While it continued to shelter Phoenix from interacting with a different world than what she was accustomed to, she never batted an eye. Her enthusiasm for learning, knowledge, and participating in academics was second to none, and she excelled in all of her studies. When she wasn't doing coursework or making music, Phoenix was advancing her fencing skills, attending rigorous practices that led her to ultimate championing of the sport as she retained the local junior fencing title. From 2007 to 2011, Phoenix attended the University of Missouri-St. Louis, moving into an apartment with a friend. Around this time, Phoenix started displaying a different side of her personality, struggling to reconcile with her sheltered upbringing and strict lifestyle. She began arguing with her parents more frequently and participated in risky behavior. While it was a contrast to the normal Phoenix that her parents knew, either Gloria nor Lawrence figured it to be any more than the pains of entering adulthood. That is until May of 2011 when Phoenix returned home at the demand of her mother, and tensions skyrocketed. Throughout the next months, Phoenix's abnormal behavior hit an all-time high when she broke off her closest friendship with her longtime neighbor, Akira, after an argument forced Phoenix to admit she was uneasy about something in her life. Something that would not be cracked by either Akira or the Colden family. As the warmth of summer turned to the chills of winter, Phoenix's crisis worsened. Her parents and few friends described her as a different person. No longer was she the well-balanced, soulful woman with a great sense of humor, strong in her faith, naive about the world, and ambitious to live up to the world's expectations. Instead, she was a shell of her former self. Both Gloria and Lawrence Colton felt that their daughter's own soul was on the brink of returning. But sadly, never knew for sure when, on a silence in the afternoon, Phoenix walked out of a Spanish lake home for the final time, not to be seen or heard from again leaving nothing behind but odds and ends in her car, abandoned in the middle of the road on St. Clair Avenue. Sometime in the year 2005, Phoenix called on Meets Akira in the Spanish Lake neighborhood, and the two quickly become good friends. Because Phoenix is homeschooled, she waits by the bus stop each day for when Akira arrives home after public school. Phoenix isn't allowed to go over to the Hogan household much, so her relationship with Akira and her mother Martini consists of talking on the front porch. The Hogan see Phoenix's parents as a little too strict as a result. In the fall of 2007, Phoenix enrolls in the University of Missouri, St. Louis, eager to explore lifestyles differing from the religious-tempered world she knew growing up. Around the time of starting college classes, Phoenix meets a guy named Michael B., they soon enter a romantic relationship despite her parents' disapproval of him. Over the next few years, Phoenix and Michael B. hide most of their intimacy from the Colton family. 
They move into an apartment together with the help of Phoenix's mother, Gloria, who signs the lease under the impression that her daughter is moving in with a female friend. Gloria proceeds to visit the flat multiple times in the duration Phoenix lives there and not once sees a clue that alerts her a man is living there. At some point in 2010, Phoenix informs her childhood friend, Akira, back at home, that she wants to leave Michael B., but isn't sure about how to go about it. Instead, she starts meeting other men. One of the men is another person named Michael, referred to as Cell Phone Mike. Phoenix heats up a second romantic relationship with Cell Phone Mike behind the back of Michael B. Around the same time, Phoenix purchases an alternative cell phone plan behind the back of her parents. She uses the burner phone to communicate with Cell Phone Mike and her phone from the family plan to upkeep her normal life with Gloria, Lawrence, and Michael B. In the months leading up to spring of 2011, Phoenix secretly steals money from the Colton family safe in their home. The money in question is in the form of savings bonds under Gloria Colon's name. Phoenix discreetly cashes these bonds at various points, pulling in around $2,500. What happens to this money isn't known. When May of 2011 arrives, Phoenix moves back in with her parents. At their request after they decide paying for the apartment is financially difficult, and their house is technically closer than her apartment is to the university. The situation begins to unravel in the summer of 2011, when Phoenix has a mental breakdown in front of her friend Akira. Phoenix claims she has the feeling that she's being followed, specifically saying that an anonymous person or people are watching her and the Colden family in the park one day. It is a paranoid discussion with unsettling foreshadowing in which Phoenix shares she has a feeling that something is after her and something is going to happen. On November the 15th of 2011, Phoenix records a selfie video on her phone while she sits in her car, expressing the extreme frustration she has with herself and the emotional crisis she's in. Phoenix appears distressed and on the verge of tears, saying things like she wishes she could start over. She also recites an altered version of the serenity prayer. During Thanksgiving break later in the month, Phoenix meets with an old friend from her teenage years, Tim Baker. She confides in him that despite telling people she's at the university, she never actually enrolled in classes that semester. Given the secret from her family, Tim knows about the second burner phone and realizes Phoenix is living a double life and feels like she's hiding something from him too. Not long afterward, Sometime at the end of November or early December, Phoenix has another fiery incident with Akira. This time, she argues with her best friend about petty little issues regarding their friendship and Michael B. It escalates when Phoenix reveals she carries a 10-inch dagger knife stored in the driver's side door of her car. Akira thinks Phoenix is just trying to intimidate her and claims she's done nothing wrong. After Phoenix hints that she's going somewhere to get away, Akira claims this mental state is totally abnormal for Phoenix and, like Tim Baker, feels that her friend is hiding something. Throughout the first weeks of December, Phoenix makes an increasing number of phone calls to her original boyfriend, Michael B., via her family plan's cell phone. On December the 17th, she engages in 10 separate phone conversations, ending with a 116-minute call unknown as to what it is about and if it played a role in the mind-numbing mystery about to unfold. At 9.34 a.m. on December the 18th, 2011, Phoenix makes a two-minute phone call to a friend Rosie again using a family plan and cell phone. Five minutes later, at 9.41 a.m., Phoenix makes a six-minute call to Michael B. on the same cell phone as before. At 11 a.m., Phoenix attends the morning service with her mother, Gloria, at their usual church. Phoenix performs in the handbell choir and appears like her normal self to the congregation's pastor, Mark Miller. After church, Phoenix makes the last recorded cell on her family plan cell phone to Michael B., a call that only lasts one minute with unknown details. Not much time passes before Phoenix and Gloria run an errand to the grocery store around 2 p.m. On the way home to Spanish Lake, Phoenix turns to Gloria and says, Mom, we need to get back to the way we used to be. Gloria responds asking, 
What do you mean, Phoenix? And Phoenix says, We just need to be more what we used to be like. Gloria figures, the old version of her daughter is coming back. Five minutes past 3 p.m. later that afternoon, Phoenix walks past her father silent yet determined. She hops into a black 1998 Chevy Blazer and backs out of the driveway. This is the last known sighting of Phoenix called on. About two and a half hours later, at 5.27 p.m., East St. Louis Police Officer Perry received a call about an abandoned car in the middle of the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue. Officer Perry arrives on the scene in 8 minutes at 9.35 p.m. and finds an empty black Chevrolet Blazer sitting in the middle of the road near a stop sign. Assuming the vehicle ran out of gas, Officer Perry checks out the interior. He finds the engines not running, the lights are off, bearing no purse or phone inside, no sign of struggle, and resting there like any normal parked car would. He runs the license plates to see if it comes up as a stolen car in the database, but produces no hits that he calls a local towing company and runs the VIN number, confirming that the car was actually from Missouri and probably crossed state lines on a routine drive. Officer Perry enters the car's data into a nationwide car logging system, but the delay in the program causes the vehicle to remain absent from the National and Pine Register. Later in the evening, the car is taken into an Illinois car and truck in Pan Lot, but the owners of the vehicle are not contacted. The next morning on December the 19th, Glory and Lawrence awake and immediately feel concerned for the daughter who never stays out all night and hasn't been heard from since the previous afternoon. When Gloria calls law enforcement and provides Phoenix's date of birth, the police announce that because Phoenix is a legal adult and has only been gone less than 24 hours, there's no reason to believe she's missing. Gloria persists and informs the officers over the phone that Phoenix was in the 1998 Chevy Blazer, so they run a vehicle check. However, no red flags pop up in the system, despite the impound on the 18th. Over the next couple of weeks, the Golden family urges endlessly for their daughter. They pass out flyers, call nearby hospitals, and visit potential hiding spots around town. Gloria even calls multiple local news stations, but none of them air Phoenix's story or help spread awareness. At the end of December, Gloria and Lawrence are informed that one of their vehicles has been impounded at an East St. Louis car lot. They rush across the Mississippi River to find their Chevy Blazer exactly how Officer Perry found it, strewn with odds and ends belonging to Phoenix but showing no sign of conflict. Gloria feels Phoenix was most certainly not the one who put the car on St. Clair Avenue, while Lawrence gets a sense that Phoenix is ultimately okay. On New Year's Day 2012, authorities finally pick up the case and declare Phoenix Colton an official missing person a little over a week later on January the 9th. Phoenix's profile is first reported by news outlets and is given special spotlight by Sianria Thomas on January the 25th who then accidentally shares false information about the state of the Chevy Blazer found on December the 18th, leading viewers to believe Phoenix had been taken from the car with its engine still running and door ajar. In February of 2012, the Colden family hires a private investigator, Steve Foster, to find Phoenix. Along with the local police department, detectives interview all known suspects including both of the Michael boyfriends who are cleared after interrogation. This would be the only time either boyfriend spoke out about the case, and their transcripts have not been released. Steve Foster also discovers Phoenix's safe-stealing habits, which leads to the reveal of Phoenix Colden's second birth certificate under the name of Phoenix Reeves, her mother's maiden name. Over the next couple of years, Tens of thousands of tips come in regarding potential sightings of Phoenix. However, none bear any real fruit. These false wolf cries force the Colden family into spending more money they had on PIs to track breadcrumb trails with dead ends, leaving the family no choice but to foreclose their home without any tangible hope. The police are unable to find any real clues or physical evidence either. In 2018, the Oxygen Television Network videotapes a separate investigation into the disappearance of Phoenix, with the original investigative reporter, Sean Dry Thomas, 
and the retired police deputy, Joe Delia. The two combed through the major points in the case and brought a third private investigator, Dean Duke, to run a detailed database analysis of the second birth certificate of Phoenix. The system reveals only four matches in the United States. Three of them are ruled out with complete profiles. However, one sticks out as peculiar. The final Phoenix Reeves's match has no date of birth, no social security number, and no relatives. Just an address for a house in Anchorage, Alaska, that was active from January to June 2012. Joe and Dean traveled to Alaska and interviewed the neighbors around the address regarding Phoenix. However, none recognize her name from her missing posters. They eventually contact the woman now living in the house that was matched in the database. But the woman says that she's been the sole owner of the place since 2002 and has never seen or heard of Phoenix, neither with the Reeves nor called on surname. While both private investigators are convinced their suspicious profile is that of the real Phoenix called on, they have little else to go on. This is the most recent development of the still frozen solid disappearance. When looking across the entirety of Phoenix's cold case, there are plenty of curious items that could play a major role in the investigation. However, the one piece of evidence that provides the most critical information about Phoenix and her train of thought is the selfie video she recorded on November the 15th, 2011, just shy of one month prior to her vanishing. Unfortunately, the entire video itself has not been released to the public but there are intriguing pieces of direct quotes from Phoenix originating from the video that we've collected for the case file. She starts off by claiming she got ditched by an anonymous person or persons. She follows up by saying, This is ridiculous. I just want to start over. I just feel like I can't start the new me over. A few moments pass, and she continues with, I don't know. I've got to see things for what they are. You know, like instead of thinking about it like that, see things for what they are. Phoenix trails off, saying a few inaudible lines before looking into the camera and reciting a version of the serenity prayer. As Lord, please help me accept the things that won't change, and that I won't change the things that I can't change. Further along the video, Phoenix explains that's why I don't like talking to people when I'm mad or whatever because I say stuff that I don't mean and that's when you learn to hold your composure. I want people to take me seriously. Due to the poor quality of the sound and a few moments where Phoenix was mumbling, it's hard to make out what she's saying. Investigators, Chandra Thomas and Joe Delia, took the video to an audio engineer Brian Kaskin to clean up the audio and decipher the rest of the dialogue. He unveils a portion where Phoenix says, I just want to be happy. I feel so stupid because I let myself go a little bit. I probably would have been in a better situation if I would have stuck with how I used to be. She then proceeds to say, Might as well ride in the back with the cops all up in here. The only person that won't let me down is me. It's unknown how much longer her self-reflection goes on for, but at the end of the video, Phoenix gives one last look into the camera and says bye. Throughout the conversation she has with herself, Phoenix takes plenty of long pauses looking outside the window with a somber, agitated demeanor. Her voice is mellow, soft, and sometimes indistinguishable, yet doesn't come across as calm. Rather, Phoenix sounds as if she's truly worried about the state she's in, consciously struggling with her life in that moment compared to the good-natured lifestyle she lived in prior. It's in these moments that Phoenix herself clarifies she has been a completely different person for better or for worse. Some investigators theorize that Phoenix references a situation that's put her in legal trouble, all that she's hanging around a bad crowd of people are pushing her to want out. Regardless, it's clear Phoenix is struggling with internal conflict, most likely as a result of external pressures. She seemed to rely on no one but herself and her trust in the people around her is obviously deteriorating. Despite the tense atmosphere, however, Phoenix displays her sensitivity and cognitive ability to understand the world. She's attempting to decipher the present by working through the past to hopefully set up a brighter future. Sadly though, the timing of the video and being so close to the disappearance 
leads all involved to believe her crisis played a major role in the events. That mysteriously unfolded. The seven years since Phoenix's cold case has entered the public sphere. The most discussed theory revolves around a possible human trafficking incident. When her disappearance was first reported, a rumor started that the 1998 Chevrolet Blazer driven by Phoenix was discovered on the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue with the engine running, the lights on, and the driver's side door swung open. This version of the story implies that Phoenix was most likely taken out of the car by a second party, and the Chevy was untouched. So who could have kidnapped Phoenix from her vehicle with a sudden force? Well, it just so happens that the 900 block of St. Clair U is positioned right next to the Interstate 70 Highway, branded as the Human Trafficking Highway of America. Not only that, but the area surrounding St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis is notorious for high levels of crime, gang, and drug-related activity and human trafficking itself. Thus, multiple theories suggest Phoenix was driving in East St. Louis for whatever suspect business she had involved herself in months prior, was targeted by a group of pimps or trafficking operatives, and taken away while at the stop sign and kidnapped into the underground oblivion. Human trafficking survivor, Kat Summers, believes the case had Earmark's usual trafficking situations, again, pointing to the state of the car and degraded status of East St. Louis street life. Katie Rhodes, the founder of Healing Action, also felt like Phoenix was most likely pulled into the human trafficking sector. Although she claims Phoenix went into it with a sense of autonomy, Katie explained that pimps are master persuaders, often seducing their victims with the promise of freedom away from the control of parents. That would definitely be the case for Phoenix, who was unhappy living back at home and constantly fighting with her mother. If she was enticed to enter the realms of prostitution in exchange for independence, the pimp would have worked quickly to disorient Phoenix and strip her personal life away. To add fuel to the fire, a woman from the local St. Louis Mothers of Missing Children group claims that in 2017, she received a message that included a link and a picture of Phoenix associated with a suspicious escort website. However, when investigators used the link directed them to a fake Facebook page with Phoenix's picture in the profile image, proving to be nothing more than a cruel hoax. This wasn't the only alleged sighting of Phoenix throughout the years though. In March of 2014, an old friend, Kelly Fronaut, reportedly sees Phoenix on a plane going home from Las Vegas. Kelly was seated on her flight during boarding and looked up, catching a glimpse of a woman who appeared to be Phoenix with a group of women staring straight ahead. Kelly called her name to which the woman looked up immediately and asked Kelly if she looked like someone. Kelly responded with the air. You looked like my friend, Phoenix. But this woman kept going, never engaging with Kelly again. She was wearing a zipped-up jacket, nice jewelry, along with women all bearing the same likeness. There were two men in the group with them, pro football player types in the age range of 35 to 40 years old. When they landed in St. Louis, Kelly disembarked and went to Southwest Airlines service counter, saying she saw a missing person on the flight. Police came and combed through the airport but never found the woman thought to be Phoenix or her crew members. Kelly is adamant the woman was Phoenix, raising her confidence a 9 out of 10 during the Oxygen documentary series. There isn't much evidence to refute the possibility that Phoenix disappeared into the human trafficking trade due to the geographic tendencies and history of East St. Louis. Yet it's hard to accept this when the state of the Chevy showed zero signs of struggle. While there were a few odds and ends strewn about the interior of the car, either Phoenix's purse nor cell phone was found, unlike the original report stated. The car was abandoned rather than broken into. Unless Phoenix was taken somewhere, and the car was dumped afterward, it's unlikely Phoenix was forced out. This then leads people to believe Phoenix was lured away by someone she knew and murdered. St. Louis, Missouri, is the top five city for violent crime in America, and many sleuths point to the boyfriend's situation and the secret nature of a double life outside of Spanish Lake. Michael B. was thoroughly investigated by police and early private detectives, and all parties are convinced he is innocent. 
While his alibi is unknown, cell phone Mike also makes sense as a suspect. In fact, cell phone Mike actually had a restraining order against him by a separate ex-girlfriend who claimed he was both emotionally and physically violent. Not only this, but during Christmas time of 2011, a week after Phoenix disappeared, the ex-girlfriend states that cell phone Mike took special interest in missing person cases around the area, specifically checking up on the status of Phoenix's case. After authorities reported it official, the ex-girlfriend confronted cell phone Mike about these interests. He said Phoenix had been a customer at the convenience store he worked at, ending with a shouting match in which he asked, Why are you worried about someone that's dead? The ex-girlfriend has since declared she is unsure if cell phone Mike was just assuming or knew for sure. Even with the two Michaels cleared by police, a potential murder makes sense when considering all of Phoenix's banknotes, cell phone records, and social media posts came to an abrupt halt the day she vanished. She found that she was being followed for months, leading up to the disappearance, and saw darkness on her horizon. The videos she recorded stemmed from a hypothetical sticky situation in which she found herself in trouble involving the police and more than likely a larger and no number of people. Taking it all into account, it makes sense to believe Phoenix's involvement with foes outside of her known social circle led her to illegal doings. Her use of the burner phone was used to navigate these operations, and on December the 18th, she went out to resolve a dispute ending up a homicide victim at the hands of these anonymous connections. All that being said, police are aware of the second cell phone and haven't reported it as a piece connecting Phoenix to any criminal organization. And while it is possible that because the search is ongoing, law enforcement cannot unveil case details, there's just not enough observable evidence to indicate foul play is involved. There's no blood, no wanted suspects and no DNA in a Chevy Blazer that belongs to anyone other than Phoenix, Gloria, or Lawrence Colton. Nevertheless, no theory can be completely ruled out with the bizarre events surrounding Phoenix's vanishing and life as a whole. Living two lives with one being a complete mystery to the people investigators have access to makes extracting leads and following clues a naturally tedious and borderline impossible task. Absorbing all of the information, interviews, and intelligence provided across the board by multiple private investigators, we've concluded that Phoenix Colton up and left Spanish Lake on her own accord, with the help of friends at first, using her pseudonym, Phoenix Reeves, and the alternative birth certificate before building a completely new identity and dissolving into society under a new independent position of power. First, let's discuss the abandoned Chevy Blazer, the contents of the car mostly junk and random garments, leaving no signs of illicit activity or foul play. The collection agency notice regarding Phoenix's unpaid burner phone bill that was discovered makes people question why she would leave it behind so carelessly. But ultimately it wouldn't matter because the phone was still under her name and easily accessible by authorities with investigative abilities. The vehicle itself looked parked and planted from first sight, according to Officer Perry and was most likely used as a decoy maneuver by Phoenix, whoever was helping her leave. Putting the Chevy in East St. Louis would make it seem like something criminal encountered Phoenix and lead searches on a wild goose chase when really it was more than likely camouflage. Once the car was set up, Phoenix most likely had another person drive her away or had another car at the ready. In addition, there's a chance that the Interstate 70 being so close as the trafficking highway of the U.S. was merely a coincidence. In reality, it being a nearby escape route for a quick departure. It's also important to note that East St. Louis is across state lines in Illinois, which would later prove to throw a wrench in the initial search for Phoenix and the vehicle within the automobile database. The second key to the maze is Phoenix's immense critical thinking skills and subtle resourcefulness. Known associates of Phoenix described her as able to make friends with just about anyone, allowing her to adapt to a variety of situations and befriend people with specific sets of services. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Phoenix met friends of friends who could assist with leaving the community and restarting an anonymous life. 
Now who these suspects might be and to the degree of their craft is unknown, but Phoenix did have a head start with two birth certificates. Using the Phoenix Reeves document for secret plans wouldn't be tracked right away at all and would buy her precious time. She could make purchases, apply for a new social security number, and access any number of resources outside of the Golden Legacy. She was obviously smart enough to hide a second cell phone plan from her family and some of her friends and could have had any number of other phones or communication methods. Remember, she was also intermittently stealing savings bonds from her family safe before moving back home, a potential method of collecting funds for her future departure. When the two private investigators, Joe Delia and Dean Duke discovered the Phoenix Reeves identification address in Anchorage, Alaska, they visited the neighborhood but came away empty-handed. Apparently, the woman who lived on the address under Phoenix Reeves owned the property during the month when Phoenix was linked to it, from January to June 2012. However, this woman had never rented it out since purchasing it in 2002 and never saw anyone who looked like Phoenix during her 25-year residency. Yet something isn't right about this anomaly. It just so happens that Phoenix Reeves' profile had zero information points except for an address that was dated just one month after Phoenix disappeared and appeared to be a sensible runaway location. Nobody in Anchorage would recognize Phoenix if she did indeed travel there to hide or plan a further identity transformation and would serve as an excellent middle ground between the United States and starting anew in a foreign place like Japan. It also can't be ruled out that Phoenix paid off the woman who owned the house on record. Either way, we believe there's something very suspicious about Anchorage, Alaska. And concur she was definitely there at some point after her vanishing. In addition, many friends and connections to Phoenix have been less than welcome to reporters, investigators, and anyone looking for answers. While they haven't been necessarily silent, a lot of her friends simply do not want to talk. Human trafficking survivor, Kat Summers, believes the case had Earmark's usual trafficking situations, again, pointing to the state of the car and degraded status of East St. Louis street life. Katie Rhodes, the founder of Healing Action, also felt like Phoenix was most likely pulled into the human trafficking sector. Although she claims Phoenix went into it with a sense of autonomy, Katie explained that pimps are master persuaders, often seducing their victims with the promise of freedom away from the control of parents. That would definitely be the case for Phoenix, who was unhappy living back at home and constantly fighting with her mother. If she was enticed to enter the realms of prostitution in exchange for independence, the pimp would have worked quickly to disorient Phoenix and strip her personal life away. To add fuel to the fire, a woman from the local St. Louis Mothers of Missing Children group claims that in 2017, she received a message that included a link and a picture of Phoenix associated with a suspicious escort website. However, when investigators used the link directed them to a fake Facebook page with Phoenix's picture in the profile image, proving to be nothing more than a cruel hoax. This wasn't the only alleged sighting of Phoenix throughout the years though. In March of 2014, an old friend, Kelly Fronaut, reportedly sees Phoenix on a plane going home from Las Vegas. Kelly was seated on her flight during boarding and looked up, catching a glimpse of a woman who appeared to be Phoenix with a group of women staring straight ahead. Kelly called her name to which the woman looked up immediately and asked Kelly if she looked like someone. Kelly responded with the air, You looked like my friend, Phoenix. But this woman kept going, never engaging with Kelly again. She was wearing a zipped-up jacket, nice jewelry, along with women all bearing the same likeness. There were two men in the group with them, pro football player types in the age range of 35 to 40 years old. When they landed in St. Louis, Kelly disembarked and went to Southwest Airlines service counter, saying she saw a missing person on the flight. Police came and combed through the airport but never found the woman thought to be Phoenix or her crew members. Kelly is adamant the woman was Phoenix, raising her confidence a 9 out of 10 during the Oxygen documentary series. There isn't much evidence to refute the possibility that Phoenix disappeared into the human trafficking trade due to the geographic tendencies and history of East St. Louis. 
Yet it's hard to accept this when the state of the Chevy showed zero signs of struggle. While there were a few odds and ends strewn about the interior of the car, either Phoenix's purse nor cell phone was found, unlike the original report stated. The car was abandoned rather than broken into. Unless Phoenix was taken somewhere, and the car was dumped afterward, it's unlikely Phoenix was forced out. This then leads people to believe Phoenix was lured away by someone she knew and murdered. St. Louis, Missouri, is the top five city for violent crime in America, and many sleuths point to the boyfriend's situation and the secret nature of a double life outside of Spanish Lake. Michael B. was thoroughly investigated by police and early private detectives, and all parties are convinced he is innocent. While his alibi is unknown, cell phone Mike also makes sense as a suspect. In fact, cell phone Mike actually had a restraining order against him by a separate ex-girlfriend who claimed he was both emotionally and physically violent. Not only this, but during Christmas time of 2011, a week after Phoenix disappeared, the ex-girlfriend states that cell phone Mike took special interest in missing person cases around the area, specifically checking up on the status of Phoenix's case. After authorities reported it official, the ex-girlfriend confronted cell phone Mike about these interests. He said Phoenix had been a customer at the convenience store he worked at, ending with a shouting match in which he asked, Why are you worried about someone that's dead? The ex-girlfriend has since declared she is unsure if cell phone Mike was just assuming or knew for sure. Even with the two Michaels cleared by police, a potential murder makes sense when considering all of Phoenix's banknotes, cell phone records, and social media posts came to an abrupt halt the day she vanished. She found that she was being followed for months, leading up to the disappearance, and saw darkness on her horizon. The videos she recorded stemmed from a hypothetical sticky situation in which she found herself in trouble involving the police and more than likely a larger and no number of people. Taking it all into account, it makes sense to believe Phoenix's involvement with foes outside of her known social circle led her to illegal doings. Her use of the burner phone was used to navigate these operations, and on December the 18th, she went out to resolve a dispute, ending up a homicide victim at the hands of these anonymous connections. All that being said, police are aware of the second cell phone and haven't reported it as a piece connecting Phoenix to any criminal organization. And while it is possible that because the search is ongoing, law enforcement cannot unveil case details, there's just not enough observable evidence to indicate foul play is involved. There's no blood, no wanted suspects, and no DNA in a Chevy Blazer that belongs to anyone other than Phoenix, Gloria, or Lawrence Colton. Nevertheless, no theory can be completely ruled out with the bizarre events surrounding Phoenix's vanishing and life as a whole. Living two lives with one being a complete mystery to the people investigators have access to makes extracting leads and following clues a naturally tedious and borderline impossible task. Absorbing all of the information, interviews, and intelligence provided across the board by multiple private investigators, we've concluded that Phoenix Colton up and left Spanish Lake on her own accord, with the help of friends at first, using her pseudonym, Phoenix Reeves and the alternative birth certificate before building a completely new identity and dissolving into society under a new independent position of power. First, let's discuss the abandoned Chevy Blazer, the contents of the car, mostly junk and random garments, leaving no signs of illicit activity or foul play. The collection agency notice regarding Phoenix's unpaid burner phone bill that was discovered makes people question why she would leave it behind so carelessly. But ultimately it wouldn't matter because the phone was still under her name and easily accessible by authorities with investigative abilities. The vehicle itself looked parked and planted from first sight, according to Officer Perry and was most likely used as a decoy maneuver by Phoenix, whoever was helping her leave. Putting the Chevy in East St. Louis would make it seem like something criminal encountered Phoenix and lead searches on a wild goose chase when really it was more than likely camouflage. Once the car was set up, Phoenix most likely had another person drive her away or had another car at the ready. In addition, 
There's a chance that the Interstate 70 being so close as the trafficking highway of the U.S. was merely a coincidence. In reality, it being a nearby escape route for a quick departure. It's also important to note that East St. Louis is across state lines in Illinois, which would later prove to throw a wrench in the initial search for Phoenix and the vehicle within the automobile database. The second key to the maze is Phoenix's immense critical thinking skills and subtle resourcefulness. Known associates of Phoenix described her as able to make friends with just about anyone, allowing her to adapt to a variety of situations and befriend people with specific sets of services. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Phoenix met friends of friends who could assist with leaving the community and restarting an anonymous life. Now who these suspects might be and to the degree of their craft is unknown, but Phoenix did have a head start with two birth certificates. Using the Phoenix Reeves document for secret plans wouldn't be tracked right away at all and would buy her precious time. She could make purchases, apply for a new social security number, and access any number of resources outside of the Golden Legacy. She was obviously smart enough to hide a second cell phone plan from her family and some of her friends and could have had any number of other phones or communication methods. Remember, she was also intermittently stealing savings bonds from her family safe before moving back home, a potential method of collecting funds for her future departure. When the two private investigators, Joe Delia and Dean Duke discovered the Phoenix Reeves identification address in Anchorage, Alaska, they visited the neighborhood but came away empty-handed. Apparently, the woman who lived on the address under Phoenix Reeves owned the property during the month when Phoenix was linked to it from January to June 2012. However, this woman had never rented it out since purchasing it in 2002 and never saw anyone who looked like Phoenix during her 25-year residency. Yet something isn't right about this anomaly. It just so happens that Phoenix Reeves's profile had zero information points except for an address that was dated just one month after Phoenix disappeared and appeared to be a sensible runaway location. Nobody in Anchorage would recognize Phoenix if she did indeed travel there to hide or plan a further identity transformation and would serve as an excellent middle ground between the United States and starting anew in a foreign place like Japan. It also can't be ruled out that Phoenix paid off the woman who owned the house on record. Either way, we believe there's something very suspicious about Anchorage, Alaska, and concur she was definitely there at some point after her vanishing. In addition, many friends and connections to Phoenix have been less than welcome to reporters, investigators, and anyone looking for answers. While they haven't been necessarily silent, a lot of her friends simply do not want to talk. Ina sense. This could be analyzed as guilt behavior, but we feel that the guilt comes from their role in helping Phoenix, not hurting her, to pull off a feat like running away and becoming invisible. One would need help from the outside. Phoenix could have been using her new acquaintances as assistants in disappearing, including someone like Michael B. Their phone conversations increased in the weeks leading up to December 18th and ended with an abnormally long 116-minute call on December the 17th. We theorized the two-hour talk was a final discussion about the master plan, and the one-minute call on the 18th was Phoenix altering the plan's initiation seeing as though it was her final call on the family plan phone. Again, it's possible more calls were made on the burner phone, but without those records, it cannot be stated with 100% certainty. Finally, when drawing this conclusion, we must address Phoenix's emotional and mental state at the time of December 2011. Multiple friends described Phoenix as unlike her normal self. She was agitated, displeased, and uncomfortable. Her relationship with her mother became untenable at times, ending with arguments and disputes, but various topics as Phoenix spaced further and further away at church. Not to mention, Phoenix was constantly looking over her shoulder, regretting decisions in the past that took her down a path of present complications. Most telling of all was Phoenix's spoken wish in to start her life over, to reset her problems and return to the old version of herself. It's quite possible that she tried to do so in between November the 15th and December the 18th, 
with a couple of clues hinting at such efforts. However, it couldn't overcome the cloud of darkness that hung over her head. As her friendship with the Kira cracked and her paranoia skyrocketed, Phoenix was the product of an incredibly strict parenting style, sheltering her from real-world conflict and suppressing her social development. She was eager to expand her knowledge and experience life outside of the airtight rules found at the Golden Household. But over and over again, she was rejected of these desires by her parents. This slowly ate away at the connection she had with Gloria and Lawrence, and sadly, made it an easier decision to let go of the religious conservative front that everyone knew her by. Leaving in her eyes was most likely not an easy choice but a necessary decision to escape the decades of difficulties that eventually made life a losing battle.